Good day and hello. I'm Rock Khanna, and I'm one of uh, the leaders of McKinsey's sales and marketing practice. Thank you all for joining us today for a special discussion on blitz scaling business building with speed and agility. I'm thrilled to be joined by three esteemed guests, Reed Hoffman, who among other things, co-founded LinkedIn, is a partner at Greylock, and is the co-author of Blitz Scaling. Chris Yeh, a co-author of Blitz Scaling and the co-founder of the Global Scaling Academy. And Ari Labarkian, a, a senior partner at McKinsey who leads our LEAP practice focused on business building. Welcome, Reed, Chris, and Ari. Thank you all for being with us today. First and foremost, we hope you all stay, are staying safe in these unprecedented times. While we recognize that COVID-19 is first and foremost a humanitarian crisis, its effect on the economy and business has been vast and swift. To give you a sense of what we're seeing, McKinsey has been tracking a consumer and business sentiment across 30 different countries. We've seen an unprecedented level of change. For example, up to 70% of consumers are willing to change long-held shopping patterns. They're willing to change stores, they're willing to change brands, and they're willing to change channels. Against this backdrop, we think we're at a time of unprecedented change and a real pivot. We know speed and scale are differentiators, and companies that uh, think through how to combine, how to do that will have both you know, a great opportunity and also must do that recognizing there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. The question that many business leaders are dealing with is, what are the right set of techniques to build businesses to take advantage of these opportunities uh, given today's context? Reed, you've had tremendous success uh, building a number of leading consumer companies, and you've developed a technique that you call blitz scaling. Would you be kind enough to share with us a few thoughts on, on what you think companies and, and their leaders should be doing? Uh, thanks, Rock. Thanks, Ari. Um, and uh, nice to meet everyone uh, through the new virtual uh, WebEx experience where uh, if there was some speculation in the amongst the geeks in Silicon Valley that we're all living in a simulation, maybe that speculation has gone down uh, now that we live in this uh, new um, unfortunate uh, reality. Although, you know, here's the hope on medical technology. So the precise definition of blitzscaling is, per, uh, is prioritizing speed over efficiency in an environment of uncertainty. And that compact definition, uh, which, you know, Rock already, you know, kind of essentially alluded to in his introduction, is worth unpacking some to understand it. Because frequently blitzscaling is misunderstood as just go big fast. It's kind of like the, the you know, the first Internet boom, uh, kind of, um, you know, kind of like just, you know, kind of go for broke and nothing else matters. And actually, in fact, um, you know, if you notice, uh, the kinds of things is like business model, you know, kind of doesn't say don't have a business model, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's actually, in fact, a very precise definition that begins to show the, uh, the, the experience and the learning network that we've had here in Silicon Valley. It's also in China. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, to say which kinds of projects can you actually, what kinds of techniques can you use for speed that end up creating a, uh, an industry transforming technology, an industry transforming business uh, at the end of, of your kind of blitz scaling period. Because all businesses um, only blitz scale for a while. And I will get to a little bit of kind of like what are the choices when, you, uh, when you're building these uh, tech companies when you stop blitz scaling. And so first, what is the blitz scaling? So speed over efficiency. What it is is say, well, we live in these, uh, this new massively connected world where markets are no longer, are, are, are much more global and much less fractured and you have the protections of kind of local areas. That's both regional locality but also national. Um, obviously it's uh, delivery of services and, and products through the internet. Um, but, you know, kind of, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's transport logistics, there's, you know, payment systems, there's all of these things which have this kind of global hyper-connected scale. And that leads to what Chris and I describe as Glen, uh, Glengarry Glen Ross markets, which is off the uh, Mammoth uh, play um, and movie worth seeing if you haven't seen it, sales competition, first prize Cadillac, second prize steak knives, third prize you're fired. And that's because in a massively uh, globally connected world, more and more markets and businesses tend towards that. In that universe, being the first to scale really matters. That's the Cadillac. 
And so the question is, how do you get that speed to scale? What are the key things to do? Now, by the way, in part of getting uh, scale, it's what are the things you don't do or what are the ways that you spend uh, capital inefficiently? And capital can be financial capital. Capital can be human capital. Um, so that the uh, so that essentially you can make the this um, uh, the kind of speed to scale, and and a part of what happened in the first internet boom is you know we were experimenting that there were a bunch of things that were not great ideas because like uh, where you had businesses that didn't have network effects uh, as part of it uh, didn't actually merit all that investment in capital. Uh, the questions around well. What are the ways that you can actually be really lightweight and grow and then build out behind it uh, were kind of key techniques. And so a bunch of the stuff are the things that Chris and I go through uh, in the book, our book Blitzscaling uh, in some depth, which is like counterintuitive rules. And just to tantalize you a little bit, it's like ignore your customer, uh, embrace chaos, other kinds of things that you probably learned in, in your quest for business efficiency, because many of you have been <laughs> in this world of, of kind of uh, how to prioritize efficiency, and that's when you're tuning the kind of inefficient dials. Now, there's another part of it that's really important, which is uncertainty, because uncertainty uh, is essentially like the, the unknowns. And some of the unknowns might be markets. Some of the unknowns might be product or service market fit. Uh, but some of the unknowns might even be things like what is your actual cost of customer acquisition or what is your long-term value or other kinds of things as a as a, uh, a way of making that happen. And those uh, kinds of uncertainty, what you look at, you don't say it's all like, for example, hey, we lose money uh, and, and well, now we're going to lose money at scale. That's not the kind of uncertainty you're looking for. The kind of un uncertainty you're looking for is to say, well, actually, in fact, like, for example, say the early days of Airbnb, you say, look, well, we, we know that we have a digital marketplace. And, and so do we know what our operating margin is? Do we know what our exact cost structure will be? Do we know how customer service is going to play into that? No. Do we have to figure out all that before we go global in our scale? The answer is no. <laughs> right? Normally you say, well, we figure out all the business model and then we scale it, and we, and we tune the, the, our efficiency as we go. It's like, no, no, no. We, we, we establish the marketplace at scale, because marketplaces by definition have, have um, you know, network effects. Well mostly, um, there's nuance here, it's, it's important. To, a lot of people talk about network effects. Like every network does not have network effects, for example. Uh, there's strong weak network effects. There's a bunch of different things that go into what is kind of the, the, the professional angle of this. But that's essentially what, um, what essentially grows to, um, you know, like which kinds of uncertainty you'll, you'll tolerate and which kinds you won't. But it's many more than you will typically be taught within a, you know, a, uh, a, a, a classic, you know, high-end executive uh, management uh, experience. And it's those parameters of accepting that uncertainty in order to get to scale fast and also, you know, which things you can do later. Now, why does this matter? Is this just a weird thing that, you know, some number of admittedly really interesting um, uh, kind of tech companies in Silicon Valley and China are doing, and then the rest of it is like, okay, <laughs> doesn't matter. Well, I think the, the, the thing to track is that I think every company, especially if, say, every company greater than you know, 100 people, uh, which probably is absolutely everybody on this call by a very large margin, is on path to becoming a technology company um, because uh, the technology uh, drum by which uh, we operate, by which we differentiate, by which we, uh, we, we, we make everything happen doesn't mean that everyone is building you know, windows or cloud farms or, or, or other kinds of things, but the technology is part of uh, how you operate, part of your product and service. It's part of how, like, we're all getting instrumented by data and using data to make intelligent decisions about what we're doing. And so blitzscaling is, I think, the way that tech companies get established in the vast majority of circumstances because that – uh, when the tech becomes available, when you have a technological platform shift, you then move to that sort of you know, kind of area of competition. And so, uh, and so one of the things to think about, and tech strategy is not IT strategy. It's not like, oh, am I using Windows, Mac, et cetera. No, no, it's, it's what are the technological platform shifts and what are the ways that I am differentiating on that. And so... Um, so that's the reason why I think it matters to everybody. And then you say, well, is it actually doable for large companies? 
And actually, in fact, uh, it is. Uh, it's hard. It's not easy. Um, you know, perhaps a good example is Amazon, which you know, when it when it when it before it started really doing Kindle and AWS and everything else, it was basically a very large e-commerce provider. That if you actually looked at, a, yes, it had a website and had some good technologists doing that. That's within uh, everyone's capability of doing it. It had large uh, uh, provision and it was using robotics in its factories. You know, its acquisition Kiva, but it itself said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to take the things that we have as strong assets and we're going to build some amazing new technology. We're going to do AWS. We're going to do Kindle. And by the way, part of when you're doing technology, we're also going to fail at doing the phone. We're going to, you know, like this is, this is, not, a, this is not a risk-free endeavor. Uh, that's part of the reason why it takes a mindset. And so, and, and when they were doing it, and for example, trotting out AWS, you know, the cover of, of, of the, of, of like a lot of the business magazines was, Jeff Bezos should just mine the store, right? It, it, is, it is not an easy thing to do, but he, he, he used his position because he had this very clever idea. They said, look, we, we have this peak at, at, at Christmas, and we build all this, this technology to peak. Well, could we offer it at sale, <laughs> right? And then created a, an entire new industry. And then, of course, uh, tech companies like uh, Microsoft and, and, and Alphabet then said, okay, we have to be in this business too. And then we start blitzscaling ourselves to catch up and to be – contenders with differentiated ideas. So like, you know, the Microsoft ideas, well, we'll do uh, the blended and hybrid models so you can actually take your cloud and be a combination of cloud and on-premise. Google would say we're going to leverage unique Google assets. And then that's the, um, uh, and that's the way it plays out. So that's for kind of really key. Now, part of the, um, you know, couple last comments of the, of the kind of the blitzscaling introduction um, is that, uh, we are now all moving to global competition. Um, so while Silicon Valley has a bunch of expertise, part of the reason why Chris and I wrote this book was to try to actually get that to like folks, like you folks on the call, and and to say, look, here is the pattern of which Silicon Valley is learning about how to grow and, you know, you say disrupt, but it's really the Schumpeter creative disruption, which is the rebuild of something new, <laughs> right? So it's think of it as a rebuild. Uh, and the rebuild using modern tech and, and modern uh, business models and modern cost efficiencies, and that, that is part of how we make amazing progress and make these big jumps and do things in innovation. But obviously China is beginning to do that um, in extremely strong ways, and it isn't just, you know, kind of like, you know, ByteDance and TikTok going global, but also the, the infrastructure in terms of, of, of what they're doing in manufacturing and manufacturing lines and a bunch of other things are actually, in fact, you know, pretty deep uh, blitz-scaling uh, tech developments. Matter of fact, when I did a tour of the Shenzhen manufacturing tours, it reminded me of what outsiders coming to Silicon Valley felt like, because it was like, oh my God, I see parts of glimpse of the future uh, in terms of being a about how their manufacturing lines are being constructed and how they're iterating uh, to improve. Now, to close on the on the kind of blitz-scaling introduction, you know, there's a couple of different kind of classic challenges that are, that, are, that are kind of made to blitzscaling. So one is, well, is that all well and good when, you know, you have a, you know, a bunch of blitz capital, you know, for things like Uber and Airbnb and so forth? And, you know, well, actually, in fact, there are uh, folks who've done this within, you know, kind of, kind of public and established companies. Amazon's one, uh, Priceline's another with Booking.com. You know, it is actually, in fact, a doable thing. You have to be you have to have a mindset of a tech company. It's one of the things that's really important, but my suggestion, as per my earlier comment, is everyone should be moving in that direction. Next thing is, can you have a coherent culture, and can you, can you maintain and build that around? And actually, in fact, part of what we go through in the book is culture is extremely important to be proactive on it. And then finally, responsibility, which is, can you do this responsibly? Is this kind of one of the things where you just take too many risks? Because obviously, if you look at the whole tech clash right now, they kind of say, well, look, is, have, have, you, have you created fractures? And the short answer is you can blitzscale. It's, one of the, again, one of the reasons why Chris and I wrote the book. You can blitzscale responsibly. You just have to track major risks. And then as you're multi-threading your organization uh, to, to build against those major risks to make sure that they don't happen. And that's but, but that awareness and add into the mindset of blitzscaling is one of the really important things. So that's a lengthy introduction, but the idea is to, is to kind of throw out the, uh, the various kind of components, and obviously some of these we will uh, get into depth, but I think Chris is going to, I mean, this is uh, 
uh, rock show, but I think Chris is probably going to add in a few things. <laughs> Well, in terms of, you know, one thing that's really important to remember, especially for established organizations that are looking to blitzscale, is that, you know, oftentimes, as Reed pointed out, when people think about blitzscaling, they focus on the question of financial capital, blitz capital is what we call it, and they focus so much on that that they seem to forget that human capital is even more important than financial capital to blitzscaling. And there's a couple of ways in which this plays out. When people look at the advantage that Silicon Valley has, it is largely human capital advantage. Yes, of course, there are great venture capital firms like Greylock Partners sitting up on Sand Hill Road waiting to fund these incredible entrepreneurs, but even more important is the fact that there are all these people who have experience growing companies. And so as a startup company grows in Silicon Valley, it is relatively easy for them to bring in the human capital that allows them to grow. Now, there's a couple of very predictable ways in which human capital and talent management works in blitzscaling, and we actually cover these in the book under what we call our key transitions and our counterintuitive rules. Two of the key transitions around people and human capital are that you need to be able to transition from generalists to specialists. So in the early days of a company, because you're at what we call the family stage, where you have less than 10 people and they're all in the same room, or at least, I guess these days, all on the same Zoom, then everyone needs to be a generalist. You cannot afford to specialize and have a person say, I only do this. In fact, as Reed will point out if he tells the story of PayPal, that was a company that he helped start where it actually pivoted its business model four times in a single year. And so if people were purely specialized at that point, it would be very difficult for them to adjust. So making sure that you have a lot of generalists at the beginning of the process is essential. But over time, as the business begins to stabilize, you need to bring in specialists, people who are able to manage the specifics of globalization, of translation, of being able to attack new markets and the like. And when you consider this in the context of an established company, this is one of the reasons why it's so important to be able to bring in the right people to any innovation initiative. Many of the people in your organization are specialists. Because the business has been stable, they've specialized around specific functions. They need to get out of that mindset and get into the generalist, I will do anything it takes mindset, uh, being willing to go far beyond their traditional job descriptions. The second thing is what we call hire Ms. Right Now, not Ms. Right. So I think there's a real sense among companies that there's a war for talent and we're going to get the best people. And of course you want to get people who are smart, hardworking, have good values, fit with the culture of the company. But what's really important in blitzscaling is you're growing rapidly between different stages. Uh, we talked about the family stage. We also then have the tribe stage, the village, the city, and the nation. And each of these different stages of blitzscaling represents a completely different way of running a company. And that means that the person you bring in for one stage may not be the right person for the next stage. The VP of sales who gets you from zero to a million is not necessarily the same VP of sales that gets you from a million to 10 million or from 10 million to 100 million. So it becomes very important because you're in this race, you're locked in this Glen Gary, Glen Ross battle to dominate the market, to make sure you have the people who can help you in the phase you're in right now. And if those people are able to grow to the next phase, that's great. If they're not able to grow to the next phase, that's where the ideas of our book, The Alliance, come in. And The Alliance is our best-selling, a New York Times best-selling book about management and human capital. And what The Alliance says is that it's important to really create a specific tour of duty for your individual employees so they know what their mission is and what constitutes success. And if somebody's mission is to get the company from zero to a million, well, that's one of the things that makes Silicon Valley so great because there are people who go from company to company who are just specialized in getting from zero to a million in sales or just specialized in going from a single market to a global market. And the presence of those specialists to be able to come in at the right phase is another key way in which the human capital really comes into play. And finally, as Reed mentioned, the culture is so important because you as the founder or as the executive in charge of the project cannot be everywhere at every time. And so culture is the thing that makes sure that people are able to know what the right thing to do is, even when there isn't a rule, even when there isn't someone telling them what to do. And so the thing about your culture is it's going to evolve over time. Each person you bring in is going to help change that culture, hopefully add to that culture and make it even better. But you have to be intentional about the culture and realize that just putting a bunch of words on the wall is not enough. It's really about how you walk the walk as well as how you talk the talk. Thanks, Chris. 
Ari, do you want to maybe say a few words about how maybe more established companies, less on, on the tech, particularly outside of tech, how they can learn from this and what McKinsey's been uh, researching here? Yep, absolutely, Rock. Reed and, and Chris both touched on this, but so I'll take the lens of established companies, incumbents, large companies, medium companies that are now stepping out of the core to build something new and to blitz scale and to really create value in a new way. And I'll say a couple of things before we get into the, some of the learnings. The first is our research has shown that building new businesses is a requirement for large companies to be successful over the long term. It's no longer an option, an experiment, hey, let's put a few dollars over here, see what happens. The companies that stay at the top of all the lists you see over decades are always regenerating, finding new sources of value, new sources of revenue, and creating new businesses. So it's a requirement. The bad news is it's really, really hard for a lot of incumbents to do this, right? We touched on culture in the, in the, in the past couple of minutes here. Uh, but it turns out that the skill set required and the operating model required to run a large company is very different from the skill set and operating model required to launch and scale a new company. And so um, it's hard for incumbents. I think the success rate is something in the single digit or low double digit percentages if you look at track record across a large number of companies, different industries. So we did some analysis on the winners and some of the more successful cases, and here's a few learnings we found. The first is, and all, all of these will sound obvious, but in the moment they're, they're not so much. The first is grounding the new business in, in value, right? It's not about building a shiny object or a new technology for the sake of building a new technology. It's about creating value, understanding the marketplace, who will eventually be the customer, where will value come from. And making decisions in the context of value is important. And sometimes the best answer for value is not the most exciting answer. Uh, but it is the best answer. Um, two is uh, commitment from senior leadership, right? An incumbent has a CEO, has a management team, has a board, and they are the first investors in most cases. And so they need to be bought in to this idea and to the runway, because these new businesses do not take off on day one. There's ups and downs, and there's a period of time before they're starting to generate real return. There needs to be a real strength of will and commitment from the management team around the journey. Um, third is distance from the core, which is how do you create something that has an operating model and a culture that is much more entrepreneurial than a lot of incumbent organizations? And that sometimes requires physically separating, virtually separating, having enough of a critical mass of new people that operate differently, new skill sets from the core so that you can give this thing a chance to really scale. And as you can imagine, the flip side is if you just take the old culture and the group of people from the incumbents to build the new thing, you're really rolling the dice and putting yourself at a disadvantage. Um, the fourth is continuous testing and metrics, right? Part of this new operating model is speaking to customers frequently, often, getting feedback, learning, adjusting. You know, you hear the word agile all the time. Uh, and that's not how a lot of incumbents operate today. So continuous testing and then metrics. How you measure these businesses in the first month, in the third month, in the sixth month, in the twelfth month varies over time. What you might look for two years in will be different from what you look for a couple of months in. And getting to financial metrics and revenues and earnings too quickly uh, is, is a huge risk for these things because a lot of these things, it's not about that in the early days. Um, the right team, uh, this is a tricky one. How do you balance uh, pulling in great talent from the core with finding new skills, whether it's designers, technologists, entrepreneurs, what have you, and, and bringing in the right talent to mesh with maybe some of the, 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 the talent you bring from the core. How do you bring an unfair advantage from the core, whether it's talent or data or customers, but you don't overdo it so that you, you can create a new culture? That, that's a pretty important thing to get right. Uh, and then the last thing is just the ability to call it if it's not working, to pivot to what is working. Uh, sometimes people fall in love with ideas, they bet their careers on it, and it takes six months too long to make a pivot or to call it. And the ability to, to do that at the right time is, uh, is critical. So let me, let me stop there, but those are just a few of the things we see from an incumbent perspective. Thanks, Ari, and, and, and thanks, Reed and Chris. We have a number of questions from the audience, so maybe we'll just open it up to that. Um, maybe, Reed, a couple questions for you to start with. Um, in the book, you talk about blitzscaling 
in and in and of itself not being you know a goal, but it's rather you know, as you said, you know, Gwen, Gary, Glenn Ross. It, it, it's really about a strategic response to competition. Uh, can you share a little bit more about you know how you think about that and, and and what it is that you know companies need to change in terms of their mindsets if they think about it? Go back again to the definition of blitz going, prioritize speed over efficiency in an environment of uncertainty. Obviously, you don't like to prioritize over efficiency. You don't like to prioritize into, into uncertainty. Those are not like, oh, great, it's a, it's a choice. Like one of the more entertaining conversations I have with entrepreneurs sometimes is blitz scaling is the goal. And you're like, no, it's expensive and dangerous <laughs> and really hard to manage. You have to kind of really focus on it. However, there are, there, the primary reason why you're driven to blitzscaling is competition, either extant competition or, or like you can see the comp even if, the, if you haven't seen it, you know that it's possible to come. Uh, and so uh, what that is, is like, for example, you've got, you know, Airbnb establishing, you know, its, its conception, well, does HomeAway pivot to a platform? And then all of a sudden it already has that previous, or does WIM do, which is one of the things we cover at the very beginning of the blitzscaling book, does that, uh, from Europe, you know, does that then, you know, Europe very valuable, valuable market in the travel industry, does that then become a, uh, a, a competitive edge? And so you, you say, no, no, we blitz scale in order to get to the point where you now can't get, you can't use blitz scaling because uh, we've established the network effect, we've established the market, we've established the, the, the critical mass uh, that then makes us, puts us in a very strong competitive position. So it's a competitive response, but also an establishment uh, of using the, uh, the, the blitzscaling techniques to get into a very strong competitive position. That's essentially what uh, network effects are. And one of the things that I realized I didn't comment on in my opening remarks is when do you stop blitzscaling? Because you go, well, are you going to prioritize speed over efficiency and uncertainty forever? Well, but no, actually, in fact, you know, part of getting to really good businesses is having high operating margins at scale, that you're continuing to tune, you don't do it forever. You do you now. You may come out of it and come back to it. But part of the 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 uh, choices is to say, okay, now when I've gotten here, a blitz scaling competitor coming along the paths that I came along can't catch me in terms of my establishment of first to scale product market fit, um, and and then I can actually, in fact, run in terms of of being valued as a business. So that's the. That's the, the reason why competition, and part of the thing is with the accelerating clock of technology, whether that's, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and data, or whether or not that's cloud and digital transformation, or whether or not that's mobile, all of these accelerating clocks mean that uh, you actually, in fact, have a, you know, kind of windows that are opening up, because part of the other thing that sometimes happens is most often technological changes and revolutions happen from the side. Right, it's not going along the same path that you use to build this, but now that we have this new technology, mobile or AI, I can now do something which creates the next generation of, of, of great, uh, you know, kind of product and uh, service uh, that can actually, in fact, rebuild this market, be disruptive, be creative destruction in order to do that. And then you may have to go and do that to self-disrupt. Uh, in order to play. And so that's why competition is the major. And the one asterisk is that what other than competition, because competition is the major driver, is sometimes getting the critical mass or other, other, uh, other dynamics will sometimes lead to it. Um, but, but competition is the, is the driving drumbeat. Thanks, Reed. One other question that's come, up, come about is, um, you know, you talk about blitz scaling. A lot, of them, a lot of what you've referenced to is in the technology space. Do you think it's applicable in other industries? And, you know, if you think about that, are there some industries that lend itself to blitzscaling and others that don't? And how do you think about, you know, where blitzscaling uh, is most applicable? So it's most often associated with technology, partially because uh, you have to get, you know, like uh, as Chris was emphasizing, it's not just financial capital, but human capital. But human capital can be expensive, too, in order to do this. And you have to have a prize that's worth it. Um, and now, the reason that I, I, I say it's not only technology is because we're in the process of transforming 
you know, I think all industries are becoming tech industries. Now, some of it is just kind of the use of data and data instrumentation. I mean, you have the, well, okay, how do you, how, you know, I mean, we, we will get back to running effective airlines, but how do you run effective airlines? Well, you know, it's actually, in fact, you have data monitors and all of the a aspects of the airplane, including the engines and everything else, and so you actually, in fact, don't have any capital downturn, downtime because you're actually, in fact, doing all the maintenance and, 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 and measuring it all, you know, kind of in real time, and so you, you, you can be really efficient in the, in the actual underlying mass of capital assets within planes. Um, you know, you've got... Uh, so not just the kind of the data side, but you've got, like, for example, what is the pandemic going to do within health? Well, telehealth is going to suddenly grow massively because you have a combination of a, of, a, of a clearing out of some of the regulatory impediments together with a market conditioning where everyone's kind of using telehealth as a way of doing that. But once you, of course, start doing it, you say, all right, we're using telehealth. Well, then that introduces all of these other tech platforms. Like you can very easily imagine the build of, you know, like uh, you, you see what's happening with OpenAI's uh, GPT-3, which is uh, in-depth language and conversation. So you can imagine AI assistance on the front end of telehealth that you kind of, kind of uh, video or call in, and it starts saying, okay, well, show me the thing that you're concerned about, and have you tried this, you talked to that. And all of that intake then happens with new technological platforms that make it much more efficient by the time that when you're presenting to a nurse or a a nurse powered in partnership with an AI or and a, and a doctor, you're having much better technological outcomes. And then, by the way, when you start doing that, you realize that actually, in fact, that's what all medical visits should be like. Like even though you do it, you happen to be doing it in this world of, you know, uh, WebEx and Zoom and Teams and Meet and all the rest. Actually, in fact, that's the same thing that happens when you go to the office. It's like, okay, we're going to take a picture, and we're going to do camera, and we're going to actually bring the AI system into the, into the interaction because that's what enables those kind of technological shifts. And that's what I'm meaning when I'm saying all of these industries are shifting. And even the very big industries will start doing that. I mean, what, will, will transformations in education come out of the pandemic, given all of the adjustments that are happening, of course, because of the, the shelter in place and the, and the worries about congregation? Um, when you get to robotics, what will happen with manufacturing, what will happen with construction. I mean, you know, you, like the, the technological drumbeat. So it's not, it's, 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 it's yes, broadly within technology, um, but uh, everything is, uh, it, every industry is getting to the necessity of genetics of technology and what it's doing. I don't know if, any, if Chris, you would add anything uh, to that answer. The only thing I would add to that is in addition to the spread of technology, the thing to remember is that while blitz scaling is often triggered by technology, it's not necessary in all cases. So we talk in the book about examples of companies like the like Chesapeake Energy, which is a great example of why you should learn when to stop blitz scaling. Chesapeake Energy is a, a company that dominated shale gas for quite some time. And it was because of blitz scaling. It wasn't because they had new technologies that other people didn't. It's because they were more aggressive at leasing mineral rights while they were still undervalued. Uh, the unfortunate story, of course, is that they decided that the way to success was to lease mineral rights, not to lease undervalued mineral rights. So they ended up driving themselves into bankruptcy. But market dynamics, as long as there's a chance for a Glen Gary, Glen Ross, winner take most market, where you can dominate that market and ultimately print money for several decades, there's reason to blitz scale, and that can be true even if it is in a very old school uh, offline technology uh, technology less industry. And the thing that I want to add, oh, great, Chris, because um, uh, I knew I was looking for one of the examples that we had put in the book. Um, the uh, the thing I would add is that in the even though we have some political storms that are kind of going against globalization, I think the globalization stuff is more or less inevitable given the benefits it provides to consumers and the societies and industries and whatnot. And so while it may get reconfigured some in the current, you know, kind of global globalization, global tempest uh, for this, in the more globalization, you are getting to a much more networked world. Networked world is not just Internet. It's also, you know, uh, markets and payment mechanisms and information sources and logistics and energy and all the rest of that. And the more globalized you are, the more markets that will be like Glengarry, Glen Ross markets. Because sometimes even a 10% brand differential, like just think about, like, for example, ordering things in e-commerce. Like, it's like, okay, 
I just have a preference for that. Well, now everyone can go order that same thing, even though there isn't a network effect of the thing and so forth. But the availability of it with that, that small edge there then plays in a compounding scale once you're beginning to get to global. And so I wouldn't, um, you know, part of, I think, the way to be thinking about the kind of the, the 10 year industries of the future is that in a much more hyper connected world, there will be more markets that are like Glen Gary Glen Ross markets. And so, therefore, um, you want to be leveraging technology as much as possible, but you may actually be in places where you're considering blitz scaling techniques. And the last thing that I'd say is everyone kind of goes, well, it's like Uber. Like you're just, you know, like establishing all these uh, uh, teams and cities and you're going for broke and you don't know if the subsidy, if it's profitable after the subsidy model and so forth. And ah, actually, in fact, blitz scaling is about relative speed, right? So it's relative speed to the competition. That's the other part to Rock's comp uh, competition question is uh, actually, in fact, you need to set the tempo so that you're first to scale product market fit, you know, first to, first to the scale established. But you don't have to establish the absolute fastest tempo that you need to go unless you think that's what the competitive tempo will be, will bring. Anyway, so. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Chris. That's super helpful. Um, Chris, one additional question we got from the audience is, you know, how have, how have your views of with scaling changed uh, given the current context and, and some recent events? Uh, anything that, you know, since you've written the book that you'd say is different and changed versus what you'd originally thought? Well, one of the things that's very interesting is if you think about this past decade, we've gone from the lean startup era to the unicorn era to our current pandemic economy. And so there's been just a tremendous amount of change over that time. And people who think that they can just take a set of rules that are written in stone and apply them universally have quickly come to realize when circumstances change, you have to change your approach as well. So that's why we really tell people it's important to focus on those core principles of blitz scaling, understanding if there's a winner take most market, and understanding what are different ways that we can prioritize speed over efficiency. And there isn't a single technique that necessarily works. So for example, if you consider just one area of social networking, which is an area which has obviously produced a lot of extremely valuable companies, you see companies like Instagram coming in and creating a brand new uh, business based on photographic sharing and a photographic social network, and that was occurring during the lean startup era. Then you, later on, you see a company like Snap coming along and changing it once again. And then today, we see TikTok and ByteDance coming in and changing the market in yet a third way. And so as long as there are these new technologies, as long as there are these new markets and consumers are making changes, and as you pointed out, Rock, because of the pandemic, there's more change than ever as people have adjusted to a more virtual lifestyle, then there's going to be the need for blitzscaling. The key thing to do is, as Reed put it at, pointed out, uh, look at where you stand relative to your competition. Try to figure out where you have a competitive advantage. Because at the end of the day, blitz scaling is all about competitive advantage, where prioritizing speed over efficiency allows you to generate a lasting competitive advantage. In fact, the thing that has probably changed the most when it comes to this pandemic economy is the fact that there is such a great need for adjustment and adaptability. And, and sometimes when I talk to audiences, I tell them, you know, there's even a different way to think about blitz scaling, which is how do you pursue rapid change by prioritizing speed over efficiency? Because in an environment where there's an exponentially growing virus, rapid change requires you to be less efficient if it allows you to gain a week or a month on your competitors. Now, the reason why we keep putting out content on blitz scaling like this particular event is because we know that the circumstances are changing and people are looking for our guidance. So if you're interested in more information about our current thoughts about blitzscaling, you can go to the Gray Matter podcast from Greylock Partners. Reed and I are putting out a weekly podcast, often touching on the pandemic and how it affects blitzscaling. And of course, you can also go check out the content at the Global Scaling Academy, because as things change, we try to put out new content. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. I've got a number of questions from the attendees around thinking about this in, in a different context. You know, some of the questions are, you know, totally get the idea, got a, you know, a board of a 230-year-old company that we're trying to, trying to change things around with, and, you know, even though we're trying to do this, there's so many barriers. Uh, another question would be, you know, how do you even think about doing this in an industry like construction? And, and you know, you touched on some of these points earlier, 
um, when you talk about what you know the research McKinsey had done. Any thoughts or, or observations you'd care to elaborate on? Sure. On the question around, we have a we have an older company, 230 year old, etc. I, you know, I think it all comes down for incumbents to the mission of the company, right? Which is, um, what, is what is our mission? What was it 200 years ago? What was it 100 years ago? What is it now? And then the question becomes, what is the best way to fulfill that mission? And if a company is being honest with itself, the ways of meeting missions uh, are evolving and are changing. So uh, having the conversation on uh, what is the customer segment that we are targeting, what are their needs, how do we best meet those needs, leveraging technology, leveraging uh, new distribution channels, leveraging new analytics and data. And if you answer that question, sometimes the answer is let's keep doing what we're doing with a little bit more technology transforming our core processes. That's fine. Sometimes the answer is orthogonal solutions. And maybe there's a different uh, product set and solution set. Maybe there's a different set of capabilities that require Something we haven't talked a lot about here today yet, but partnerships and ecosystems bringing in new capabilities. So I find in, in my travels, uh, boards uh, are quite open to uh, disruption and the question of what's needed to win in this new world, provided it's framed around the mission of the company versus what sometimes happens is we got to do digital because the world is changing, let's go digital, which, which sometimes bounces off. Um, in, in the B2B context, the other question, you know, the principles stay the same, right? In B2B, you still have a client. In this case, it's an institutional client. You have to think about what's the market of your clients, what are their needs. You want to hear the voice of that client. The added complexity is institutions have their own end clients, oftentimes consumers if it's B2B to C, but not always. And thinking about how you can add value to your institutional clients and help them serve their end customers better is an added wrinkle. And a lot of times data and analytics uh, uh, plays into that, which is um, how do you gather more insights for your institutional clients on their end consumers or their downstream B2B clients, and how do you create products that can help them do their job? Having said all of that, the idea of ideation and coming up with something that's going to disrupt your B2B client world, the idea of uh, uh, gathering data to build up, the idea of creating a new culture and an agile working model, those things are all the same. It's just your client and, and your product that may look a little different in this B2B context. Thanks, Ari. Just to highlight one thing on the B2B context, like so for example, you have, uh, no, it's a tech company with great economics and technology and everything else, but you have B2B stuff happen within it. So like for example, Microsoft looks at the new world um, of you know, Slack and everything else, and it builds teams very fast uh, in order to do that. And so there, there is actually, in fact, a lot of a lot of, of blitz scaling within uh, tech and B2B as well. I just wanted to make sure that the people are aware of that. So, Brock, go ahead. Thanks, Reed. I appreciate that. There's another question for you and Chris, which is you guys also wrote the Alliance and, and you know, have thought a lot about talent. Um, you, Chris, you mentioned, you know, uh, miss right now, not necessarily miss right. Any thoughts on how you think about, you know, um, particularly within an existing company, what's the right organizational model? How, how do you think about talent in, in that context? Reed, you talked about how you know, uh, Amazon had made a bunch of changes and, and really driven new businesses. Uh, a lot of our clients are trying to think through that. Any advice or thoughts on that topic? So the funny thing about how the Alliance ended up being written is uh, the first book I'd done is called The Startup of You. And people kind of thought, oh, it's how you start companies. No, no, it's actually how you have an entrepreneurial career. Like, like e.g., think of yourself as a, as a business of one and, and how are you the entrepreneur of yourself. And then what we realized is the really important things for having adaptive organizations is to have entrepreneurially mindsetted people within them. Right? That's part of what works in kind of the culture of Silicon Valley and so forth. But if you don't have people who are thinking about, you know, how do I – change and pivot relative to changing market conditions, changing technologies, changing competitive landscapes, and that I understand that there is change afoot, and then I go have to take risk in order to, to work through the change, you have no hope. So you have to have those people. Well, what's the way that you usually recruit entrepreneurial people? Is it that, oh, come he be a member of our family for your entire time? You know, we have this one set process that doesn't change that you should be part of, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the answer is obviously no. 
And when you look at the, 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 the demographics of how a workforce is changing, one of the things we realize is most people are still using the family language of, hey, come join the family and you'll be here with the family you know, forever, when actually, in fact, that was creating a mutual distrust because more and more industries, even in Japan of all places, were getting a place where your career would, be, would, would involve multiple companies. And so how do you have that, you know, getting those adaptive people, and how do you have that as the, uh, as the way of, 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 of navigating them? And what's the, the new compact, right? And it's like as opposed to like lifetime employment, because you may not be able to provide that as an as a actual promise as you're changing and pivoting as an as a, as a employer. Uh, but also, you're not promising to be there lifetime as an employee either. And so what's the way you say that? You say, well, actually, in fact, we stay lifetime allies, the alliance. Um, you know, we help each other. We go through the, the central part of this thing as a transformational tour of duty um, with a I help the business in this really strong way, and then the business helps my career. And by the way, it may very well be that I, 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 I work here forever, even on transformational, uh, you know, my entire career, even on transformational tour of duties. There's a foundational tour of duty that says, no, this, this business is mission, this is my life's mission, we agree, I'm kind of, as it were, a, kind of a, a foundational cultural carrier, and, and this is what I'm doing. That does not necessarily uh, only the CEO position or executive positions, but other positions within the company as well. And that's why we kind of wrote the book, because we said, look, you need to understand, in order to be adaptive, you need to be recruiting and managing adaptive people. And those adaptive people, you know, in large part, don't necessarily go, I am here from when I'm 22 to 65, <laughs> right? And obviously McKinsey knows this well because the, the McKinsey has this, this, this model of, of lifetime relationship and transformation, and, you know, people get trained in McKinsey and end up in other places, and yet there's still a network. And that's one of the great models uh, for, how, how, for, for modern businesses uh, to think about this. Is there any, any parts of this, Chris, do you think I, uh, that, that for this crew that I left out? No, I don't think you left it out, but I think one other very practical thing, since we have a bunch of company leaders on the line right now, is that when it comes to organizing your internal innovation initiative, your internal blitz scaling effort, the compensation system is actually really important. So what's often the case is that people think, well, I want to attract the best people in my company to this project, so I'm going to let them continue to get their full salaries, and I'm going to give them upside. And you may think that's a good idea, but it actually isn't, because what you want to do is you want to set up a compensation system that prioritizes the people who have the confidence in succeeding. So actually, you want people to buy into the effort by reducing their salary or by buying into the stock somehow, so that only those people who are most confident of their ability to make a difference and successfully grow a business are going to say, that's the job for me versus the people who just sort of say, wow, that's a great way to get some additional upside. Let me just go for that, just like everything else. So the compensation system you choose for your internal innovation effort is going to make a big difference. Great. Thanks, Chris. You know, I think we're coming up to time. We've got about five or so minutes left. Uh, maybe I just uh, will turn it over to each of you guys for any parting thoughts. Maybe, Ari, you want to start with, with any topic, um, any parting thoughts here? I'll pull everything I said on the incumbents together into one central point, which is the challenge for companies launching new businesses off to the side is how do you create the unfair advantage from what you have as an incumbent, data, customers, brand, people, et cetera, but bring that into a startup entrepreneurial culture, putting in place all the practices we talked about. And if you're leaning too much on the unfair advantage, uh, that's not going to work. If it's too much of a startup and you're not leveraging your assets from the mothership, uh, then, then you're not maximizing value. Threading that needle is the key. And, and that usually the answer is with strong leadership and the right talent. So I'll just, I'll, I'll leave the group with that. Chris? So if you think about every industry, every company that where there's a lasting leader, somebody who's been one of these iconic companies, it's not because they did one thing perfectly for 50 years. It's because they continue to innovate. They continue to create new things. The Walmart of today is very different than the Walmart that Sam Walton first started back in Arkansas. The Amazon today is not a small online bookstore. It has many different businesses. Apple rode so many different waves, whether it was personal computers or the iPod and ultimately the iPhone. And Microsoft is no longer the maker of just a desktop operating system, but a cloud provider and a productivity software maker. So whatever your industry, whatever your situation, 
because the world has continued to change faster than ever before, you have to create new businesses. You have to blitz scale before someone blitz scales against you. And so as you're going around and thinking about the future of your company, the five, 10 year plan or wherever you think you're going, remember to build in the notion that you're going to have to build new businesses to replace the ones that are being disrupted. Thanks, Chris. Reed, any parting thoughts? So um, obviously this can seem very daunting. Um, you know, the practice that when you have blitz capital and can build from fresh versus, um, you know, rebuilding the, the plane engines while you're in flight, which is kind of the classic because it's, it's constant rebuild and rebuild as part of the things that's about business. Um, and then, uh, so there's a lot of this thing, like, oh, God. And so, um, and so I think the, the thing to remember is that uh, uh, risk-taking is not just, like, close your eyes and, like, you know, like, like driving on the highway. You close your eyes and go as fast as you can. Um, it's actually uh, intelligent risk management is a core part of innovation, a core part of blitzscaling, and that what you're looking at is to say, well, what are the ways that I can um, set it up and measure, including as like Ari was saying earlier, is say, look, if, if, if the measurement's not going well on this idea, this, this thing that I thought was the right thing, I pivot, I change, I abandon it, I do something else. And so, um, and, and, and part of the, 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 the thing that's kind of underlying, as it were, the growing expertise within blitzscaling and other things is, is how do you do smart risk management? Because part of, of blitzscaling is, is not saying just any risk matters, it's which risks do you take as part of a payment to being really successful, to adapting to the new world, adapting to the new market, uh, having a chance at being the market leader when you have this kind of platform change. And so, Another way of reading through blitzscaling and thinking about it is, is what are the various things you can do for risk management? And part of uh, risk management can be experiments, can be, you know, like uh, I think Ari also said, hey, maybe you do kind of a skunk's work, you put it over there, you see where it goes, you see what you have an opportunity. Let me, let me share with you a very mild technique that a lot of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs use at the very earliest stages because it's, it's just to illustrate, to make you think. So a frequently skilled Silicon Valley entrepreneur will go, I got this idea of this new product. I'm not sure if people, if there's a product market fit, I'm not sure if people want it. So what do they do? They build what is called a, kind of internally a paper test. They kind of like they put up a little website and say, hey, I got this great product. And then they advertise it on Facebook. And they see how many people will click through on the advertisements. They'll do A-B test on a, or anything on the advertisement. And how many people will say, oh, yeah, I want it. I want to buy it. And they go, oh, thank you. We'll get back to you when it's ready. Because it's a really cheap way of getting some market signal, <laughs> right, of like people would want this. And obviously it's one illustration of a variety of different things, depending on market, your industry, and everything else. But there's ways to try to, to do little experimental tests to get better data to de-risk certain aspects or to, to shape the risk to a, a, a more focused and, and lower element. And that risk-taking, the thing I encourage you to think about is, Every good strategy involves risk, and you're managing the risk as you're doing it. It's, if, if it doesn't involve risk, it's not actually really a strategy, um, and you may be blinding yourself to the fact that there is actually a real risk there, just like driving down the road. Oh, no risk. You know, there's always risk with other cars and a bunch of other stuff. And so, um, so to, to lean into, I know I'm taking risk. I'm aware of them. I'm being smart about it. I'm being iterative about it as my uh, commitment scales, as my, uh, my organizational commitment, my capital you know, the, the, the betting, the, the, the chips that we have in our organization on this, and think about it as an intelligent risk-taking for outcome um, game. Uh, and that, that's, that's a central thing, and that's important to have in the whole organization. Thanks, Reed. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Ari. Uh, it's been fantastic. Um, you know, as we step back at this and, and look at this, the time – for business building is now. Uh, we think we're in an unprecedented, you know, period of opportunity. You guys' thoughts have been incredibly helpful. For everyone who joined us today, thank you. And thanks for many of the questions. We know we couldn't get to all of them, so we will be fo following up with an email with some additional uh, materials that are available to folks that, you know, Chris had mentioned and Ari had mentioned as well. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Really appreciate it. Be well.